so we thought that, Emily, if you could go on, thanks. Um, we thought that this would be a really great time to check in sort of midway through the year, see how things are going. And this is also a time when many programs are starting to enroll for um, next year. So we're starting to be able to get a picture not only of how things are shaping up this year, but what things are looking for for the future for individual programs and also to kind of help us collectively think about what's the future for the field. Um, so as you know, uh, when you registered for the forum, we asked a lot of questions. Um, thank you for um, sticking with us and answering those because they really are helpful for giving kind of another snapshot of where we are now. Um, so I'll report back to you what we heard um, in those. And then as we usually do in our forums, we've invited some guests to kind of give some perspective, some examples, just to sort of see in action um, what's happening. So we'll have um, Three guests today to share with you some different perspectives. And then for those of you who have time to ask questions uh, as part of that, and then for anyone who's interested in um, sticking around to have some kind of smaller group discussions, which are also a piece of our forums, um, we have time set aside uh, in breakouts so that you can um, you know, talk together in smaller groups, dig in a little bit on some of these issues. If you choose, if not, no problem. You don't have to stay for that piece. Um, okay, thanks, Emily. Um, so our guest today, we're really thankful to have Sheila Williams Ridge. Um, Sheila is a Natural Start advisor from the very beginning of um, the Natural Start Alliance. She's also the conference program chair. She's the author of Nature-Based Learning for Young Children Anytime, Anywhere, on Any Budget. Um, and if all that's not enough, she's the director of the lab school at the University of Minnesota, and her program has transitioned to be 100% outdoors. As you'll see, that's um, typical of a lot of you out there really spending a lot more time outdoors this year. So we thought that hearing from her would be really um, helpful to get that kind of a perspective. And also we have Heather Getzinger. Um, she's the director of Nature Way Preschool, which is at the Kalamazoo Nature Center in Michigan, another cold weather place that um, is spending a lot of time outdoors. So we thought there are a lot of you out there grappling with how to do outdoor education in the winter. So hearing from really Northern programs who are spending all of their um, outdoor time, excuse me, all of their program time outdoors would be really um, helpful. So thank you, Heather, for joining. Um, and then thirdly, we have Kathleen O'Connor, who is a consultant working with NAAAE um, to assess sort of environmental education and outdoor learning broadly during the pandemic. And she's also looking at early childhood education programs. Um, as I don't think that her research is complete yet. So we're really thankful that she was willing to um, join us to give us sort of a sneak peek of what she's finding before that report comes out. Um, so big thank you to Kathleen for joining. So um, we'll hear from them in a little bit. Um, but first I wanted to share back with you what we've heard about where programs are today. Firstly, we asked you what percent of time are you spending outside? Because when we were um, at the beginning of reopening, we asked people, you know, what were the changes you were making? What are the transitions? And we saw a big shift to programs looking at spending 100% of their time outside. And here at mid-year, we find that the majority of programs are spending more than 75% of the day outside and 40% of programs reported spending the whole day outside. And just to put that into perspective, a little bit. In 2017, we did a survey just of nature-based preschool programs, so um, a narrower slice and a slice that really is committed to spending a lot of time outside. And at that time, only 25% of those programs were entirely outdoors. So this is a huge increase if you consider that this isn't just nature-based preschools, this is all kinds of schools making this big increase. So that was probably interesting. Thanks, Emily. Um, we also wondered, how's COVID going? Of course, <laughs> that's our um, major challenge this year. And um, encouragingly and luckily, um, most programs haven't had to deal with COVID cases at all, surprisingly. Um, over half of you had no cases reported, which was um, great. Um, and then of those programs who have had cases, most of those have had five or fewer cases and uh, a small minority with less, well, excuse me, more than five. Um, and then in terms of 
Demand for programs this year, um, again, the majority are reporting greater demand, which is um, something that we expected just given the interest in outdoor learning, how we all understand that it's much safer. Um, we all understand there are a lot of benefits that come with outdoor learning. So we expected to see greater demand and um, we were encouraged to see it here. What we um, also have heard from programs though, is that although there's a lot of demand, there are also a lot of challenges. Um, and you know, in some areas, families are just not ready to come back or they're not comfortable with you know, certain aspects of education in person. So um, a, quite a large number of you, about a third, um, described shifting demand where demand hasn't been consistent through the year, but only a small portion, 12%, um, reported that there's less demand this year. So that is encouraging. And in terms of looking to the future, um, the vast majority, two thirds um, of programs are seeing greater demand for next year, which really I think bodes well for um, outdoor education in the future. Um, a third, no change. And then again, an even smaller portion um, experiencing lower demand for next year. <laughs> um, there are a lot of challenges this year. I am sure that everyone on this call can appreciate one person's answer to this question. What were your challenges this year? So many. <laughs> um, I just quickly did some broad um, categories for some of the responses. They were really nuanced and wonderful, but just to kind of sum them up for you all, um, some of the things that we heard consistently were things like planning the curriculum, um, funding has been challenging. Some are still grappling with distance learning. Not all programs are back in person and are still um, trying to effectively offer online curriculum. Burnout came up um, several times. I'll get into that a little bit more. Enrollment, um, safety, a broad category there, just capturing all of the kind of COVID concerns, um, health concerns. Staffing is something that we've heard consistently. It's been really challenging. Change and uncertainty, and then broadly questions about just outdoor education came up the very most, as you can see. So I just wanted to give you just a sense for those kind of top three, what some of those specific concerns were. Again, it's I, there are so many <laughs> that were listed that I won't go into a lot of detail, but for outdoor education, again, you remember that was one that overwhelmingly people um, talked about. And within that category, overwhelmingly, um, the piece that we heard was questions around winter, staying warm, appropriate gear, those kinds of things um, continue to be a big question. We received a lot of questions from media over the last month or two, um, interested in whether outdoor education will continue through the year. Will people commit to, <laughs> to being outdoors, even in the cold weather? It sounds like from what we're hearing, absolutely yes. Um, many of you are spending most of the day outdoors and um, but still grappling with how to do that. Um, you know, other kinds of outdoor concerns like rain, um, what kinds of activities uh, are appropriate outside, especially for programs for whom this is new, um, have questions around that, navigating regulations in ways that we haven't before, if outdoor learning is new for you, selecting environments, and just, I, I summed up <laughs> outdoor programming in the cold. It's, it's challenging for a lot of programs. Change and uncertainty has been the constant theme throughout. Um, all of these check-ins, it's just really hard for programs to make decisions um, when you just don't know what's coming. <laughs> Everything is changing all of the time and that is really tough to navigate. Um, and then staffing is one that I don't know if everybody quite saw coming. I didn't personally as we were looking to reopen. Um, I don't know if we anticipated just how tough it would be to staff programs. I heard looking at the responses, um, specific mentions of finding teachers, finding volunteers, finding substitute teachers um, for co-op pro um, programs, getting parents, um, maintaining those small cohorts can be really challenging if you don't have the staff. Bottom line, not enough teachers. So that's been a really um, consistent challenge, it seems like, through the year. Burnout wasn't one of the most commonly um, 
cited <laughs> concerns or challenges, but it did come up several times and I was struck by how um, plainly people shared that they are exhausted, anxious, stressed, burned out, um, just keeping up the energy and excitement among teachers um, can be really hard. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and um, I don't know, there's not a simple answer, but I think it's something that we don't wanna lose sight of and we certainly wanna um, keep in our hearts and minds um, that this is a really tough time for everyone. Um, even though we're doing really wonderful stuff, it takes a toll. Um, but on the bright side, <laughs> um, we did ask you to kind of look to the future. Um, and what do you think are the prospects, either for your own programs or for the field as a whole? And overwhelmingly, by far, 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 um, very positive outlooks from um, everyone, either in terms of looking at their own program's future or the field. I just have um, noted some of the concerns and needs that some people shared because I didn't want to lose them because I thought they were really good points. Um, but they are the minority. But the kinds of concerns and needs that people uh, mentioned were, you know, just the logistics, getting everyone vaccinated, making sure that the staff is safe, keeping parents on board over the long term. They're really um, on board right now because it's a safe option. There are concerns about how it keeps them um, engaged and on board with this approach over the long term. Um, one um, person noted that we need more teachers trained in outdoor education. Now we have this huge demand. Um, we need a workforce that's ready to go to fill the needs um, and more access uh, for more families and more funding to support the field. Um, and just generally this theme of just keeping the interest up was mentioned. But like I said, overwhelmingly, um, the sentiment was that the future is very bright. So people were saying things like, um, it's very positive. We have so much room to grow. I'd like to see licensing change to accommodate what we're doing. Um, I'm continuing to hear a lot of interest in it, support for my region. I plan to update my program and add additional nature-based learning. Um, very excited, anticipating high enrollment. And um, finally, I just love this one. Moving outside has been an awesome experience and now our teachers, parents, and kids are huge advocates for nature-based early childhood education. So um, I think we have a lot to be excited about and look forward to, but we can't let go of how hard it really has been for everyone. And um, we continue to navigate those challenges, even though we're looking toward a really bright future. So thank you very much, everyone, for sharing your perspectives. Um, we so appreciate it. And um, hopefully it helps everyone kind of get a picture of where we are as a field. Um, so with that, um, I am going to um, turn it over to our speakers. Um, up first is Sheila Williams-Ridge. Thanks, Sheila. Hello, everybody. Uh, you can just leave that screen up. I'm not going to share my screen for a couple more minutes. I just wanted to do a little bit of an introduction to, to me. Um, I know some of you from earlier forums. I think this is a great way for us to get together and just talk about like the world that we live in right now. So I'm excited to be here to talk with everyone. Uh, I work at the lab school at the University of Minnesota. So we're located right outside, well, in Minneapolis, we're right outside of the downtown area. So it's a very kind of urban school. There's a train track right across from our playground. Um, we can see two freeways from here, but also the Mississippi River. Um, so there are a lot of wonderful things. I was just talking, someone said, what do your kids do all day? Cause we're outside all day. I said, we have the whole campus to ourselves. <laughs> like, what don't we do? We get to have all of the spaces that normally are full of college students are really ours right now. So it's been great. Um, universities tend to have a lot of green space. And so we are fortunate to have a lot of white space right now because it, everything is covered in snow. Um, so we serve children two to five years old and we have been operating since September. Um, we have about 60 children right now. Well, we have exactly 60 children right now um, and they come part day. So our children are here from three to four and a half hours a day. Um, oh, all right. So yeah, they're here um, between three and four and a half hours a day and they spend the whole day outside unless it is if it's below 
if it's somewhere you know below 10, the teachers have the choice if they want to, to bring in small groups of children to eat their snack inside because um, it's hard to eat without taking off your mittens. And we try, we've been trying to do more of our um, snacks on like skewers and in mugs. So we have soup some days, so they don't have to take their mittens off. But some of the very young children, the toddlers, even if you say you don't have to take your mittens off, they still won't hold the mug without taking their mittens off. So we've started to bring them inside for about 10 minutes um, to have a snack and we kind of distance them in the class. They have a little carpet score that they sit on and they have their, their snack and then they head back outside. So it ends up being a couple of minutes out of each day, which has been really great. Um, I also wanted to let you know, I am on the board for the Minneapolis Nature Preschool and they're also operating fully outdoors this year and they do not have a building. So they have an outhouse and they have an ice house, which if some of you know, it's like a pop-up tent that they use in, on days that are very cold for children to have a time to warm up. So I've got, I've had the chance to go over there a few times and um, I subbed and it was great. They have this giant, you know, the best thing about winter is that the people who plow parking lots, they give you these big mountains to play on. And so the group that I had that day played on that mountain for an hour and it was fantastic. Uh, it was just like the best, <laughs> it was the best hour. Um, so anyway, I want to make sure that I tell you some of the things about our program and I'm going to share my screen because I would like to, um, to show you some of the things that are the same at our school. Oops. So, um, so one of the things is that the lab school, a big portion of what we do is we teach student teachers and that's one of our main reasons for existing. So we have nine student teachers this semester and we want to teach them all of the things that they need to know so that next year when they go into a program, they know kind of what to do with young children and um, or some of them might go on to um, a master's program or a, or a different program. So we are um, so we're continuing to do our lesson plans in the way that our teachers always have. Um, but if you, and these are available all on our um, lab school webpage. So you can just go to, I'll share it in the chat as soon as this is done. I can't share my screen and put it in the chat very easily, but I can share a link. These are all on there and you can see what the lesson plans are. Um, and so you can see like every area of development is covered. And these are all things that are easy to do outdoors. So, um, so we have that and then you can go back. This was our first week back um, from the semester. Um, and then my page is up a little too high. Um, what we do with our families is we share documentation about the learning that has happened. And we feel like this is a really important part of the communication that is happening, that families can see the value of what's happening this year not just, you know, we do, we all have all of those challenges, but what we want them to see is the um, kind of amazing, um, I don't know if this will make it full screen or not. I'll try and make it a little bit bigger. Um, but communicating with families has been very, very important. So I'm gonna try and open that a little bit bigger for you so you can see what it looks like. Um, and communicating with them about the learning that's happening, but also about safety. So as everybody knows, there's so much uncertainty with COVID and how things change really quickly. So, um, so we've been keeping everyone updated with regular emails, things on our webpage, just so they know what's happening, what has changed in the world of COVID. Um, and then for training our, our teachers, we really want to make sure that we are helping them make learning visible both for themselves and for our families. So you can see um, they do several of these a week and, uh, and because it was our first week back, there's just this one, but you, you're welcome to check in every week and see what they've been doing. Okay, um, so that's that one. This is another classroom. So like I said, we have children two to five. We have noticed that the two-year-olds, we have to go on more hikes because they uh, will stand still a little longer than, than we hope for the days that are very, very cold. Um, and so you can see on these pictures, um, they're kind of walking around and, do, and doing different things. Um, we of course face challenges in Minnesota because it gets pretty cold here. And so we, um, we have to communicate with families about gear, about, um, how we're keeping children safe about, we do these things called body checks and it's basically a dance where we tell everybody to like wiggle your fingers and wiggle your toes and, um, and 
does anything feel cold? Um, so the teachers have been really inventive. One of the teachers made this really cool block and it's called the warm up. I think she calls it the warm up block, but it has different movements on each side. And for her large group time, each child would get a chance to kind of roll the dice and whatever activity it says is, um, and so some of them are like arm circles or like stomping like a dinosaur and they're different things to get children moving different parts of their body so that they stay warm during these outdoor times. So you can see um, all of these pictures of what children have been doing outside. And, uh, and then the other challenge that you mentioned, Christy, in the survey, which has been a little bit more difficult for us is um, subs, because we only have one teacher in each classroom um, and we rely on student teachers. Student teachers, I would say, are more likely to need a sub than a regular staff person because they're college students and, um, and they sometimes are exposed to COVID a little more often, I think, than the average person. Um, so we've had to make sure that we have a pretty healthy sub list and then we don't want subs interacting with different groups of children. So that part has also been really challenging for us. Uh, but at the end of last semester, we asked our student teachers what, um, you know, what this semester felt like to them and more than ever said that they want nature to be an integral part of their classroom when they are their own teachers. So I have some of the videos, but it was, um, I did, I should have like downloaded it into something else so that I could just show you a snippet of it because it always goes back to the beginning. But, um, but it was really great to see how the teachers, um, how the student teachers thought um, the semester went and how many of them said they were scared and they were really worried about it and that they wouldn't have wanted it any other way, that it was the best kind of teaching environment that they could have hoped for. So. Uh, so that made me feel really good about it. And, um, and then just the other challenge has been figuring out, like foreseeing what the children need um, all the time, especially the ones who are nonverbal. So our school um, prides itself on inclusion. And I'm gonna show you one more page, but on inclusion and, um, oh, this one's not working, I'll stop sharing. But um, so we have some children that are nonverbal or have a variety of special needs. And so making sure to communicate with those families and those children. We have some that have sensory things. And so they actually might go through a mask every 20 minutes. And so how many masks like do we keep on hand and how do we support them? Um, what are the different things that we need to do to make sure because frozen masks are no fun for any of us. Um, so that's, that's what I want to share for kind of how it's going right now. Uh, overall, it's going really great. Um, our student teachers that just started last week are excited. And so we sent out, you know, the gear list, like come prepared and, you know, wear all of these things. And the first Friday, the teachers were like, I was too warm. I was so scared. And it was like nine degrees. And they were like, but it was a beautiful day and the sun was shining and we loved every minute of it. And they couldn't wait for the next week to happen. And so that made me feel really good that I, I was like, it's better to be overprepared when it's going to be, because we had some, some days this week that were pretty cold um, in the morning. And so it was better for them to be overprepared than underprepared. And now they feel really confident in their skills working with children, which is how we want teachers to start their day um, and their career in a space of confidence. So that's it. Uh, I'll let Heather go next, I think. Okay, hi everybody. Can you see and hear, see my screen and hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Heather Getzinger and um, I am the director at Nature's Way Preschool and uh, I have been here about nine and a half years. Um, and I think I missed my first slide. I already skipped past it somehow, but um, I wonder if I can go back. Oh, sorry guys. Let me go through. Um, ah, there we go. Okay, so um, on the left there, that picture of the little cabin, that was our school for um, about 30 years. And I think when uh, Rachel Laramore wrote her book about um, starting a nature preschool, I think she, uh, researched us to be the fourth longest running in, in the country. So it's been around a long time. Um, and then uh, the year before 
um, we built our new school, I became the director. And um, that middle slide there shows our new school right next to our where our old school was. We took down the cabin, but we um, kept that fireplace, which is an outdoor fireplace for us. And um, we doubled our space and, and increased our enrollment quite a bit. So that picture on the right in the snow, that's the back of our school. So we have two classrooms. Um, and they look out into the woods, we have um, 30 acres behind our school. So um, we have half day sessions. In a normal year, we have 128 students. And this year, right before school started, um, understandably, a lot of our families um, dropped in each class. They were uncertain or um, just just weren't ready to come back to school. And so our class sizes were a little smaller this year and we decided to just um, hold steady there and not add any more students. So our three, our three-year-old classes have 12 this year and our four and five-year-old classes we um, kept at 14. So a little bit smaller, which has been helpful. Um, around our school, we have two natural play areas with um, pretty typical natural playground things like mud kitchens and sand pits and things like that. And then the woods are behind our school. We have a creek and a, and a wetland area. Um, and we are owned by a nature center, but our program is offsite. So we are the only people that use our space. We don't um, have to share our woods with um, public visitors, which um, is kind of a, um, a big benefit of our, our little woodsy area. So in a normal year, we would usually have our students play about an hour on our play areas and then um, about an hour in the woods and then we'd be inside for an hour. And when we came back for COVID, we committed to being fully outdoors. And the teachers were right on board from the beginning with that. And, and that was what made them feel like they would come back and could feel comfortable coming back. And so we knew the winter would challenge us, but um, we felt like if we started in the summer and fall with all of the new COVID procedures by winter, we'd feel a lot better about everything and being, being outdoors all the time. And that would kind of help with some of the weather challenges. Um, so we did come back in July with our students from last school year. And we did that because those families ended their year so abruptly in March and, and then there was no school April, May. And um, it was kind of a way to kind of regather and, and some closure with, the, with those families. And um, it really helped us to start all of the new COVID stuff with our students who we had had several months with. And so we didn't have to teach them everything like you know, how to use the bathroom at school or how to say goodbye and all of that. So we kind of had a practice month in July and then we started in September with new students. Um, so one of the first things that we did when we came back in July, one of the early recommendations was to have um, smaller cohort groups within the class. So if there's 14 in a class to, um, create kind of smaller groups yeah. when anytime they're close together, those same students yeah. are near each other. So um, we made four color groups and you can see um, our teacher, Lindsay here, she's with her yellow group, they're playing a music game. And when the students are in free play around the school or in the woods or hiking, um, they're, they mingle and mix with whoever. So it's um, just kind of those close interactions that, um, like snack time in the mud room. We also purchased colored tarps in our color groups, orange, yellow, green, blue. So we could lay down the tarp and they'd go sit on the, the color for snack. Anytime that we thought the risk of spread would be the greatest, whatever that activity was, we would have them sit with their color group. And we started when we came back with the net gaiters that you can see our friends wearing there. Um, and they worked really well. We sewed a, if you can see me, we sewed a cotton mask inside of them so that they would be more effective because the single gaiters um, are quite thin. But um, what happened once we got to about November and things got damp and cold and maybe some flurries and rain, then this being around their neck all day, they weren't too excited to pull it up over their face. 
Um, it just, and then once the gear got added, it got tricky to, to deal with these. And um, the teachers were noticing that they did okay to, because um, our masking rule was, is just when you come in to use the bathroom or wash their hands, pull your mask up. So it was fine for that. But um, right around the holidays, when um, the things were getting a little scarier with the COVID numbers, and we weren't sure we could really remain fully outdoors on super cold days, um, we thought we should switch to the regular masks. And so we asked our students to come back from Christmas with a mask that they would leave at school. And we just um, wash them every day in these um, laundry bags, zip them up and wash them. And um, the reason we did that is because we are coming in now, like today it was eight degrees, which is pretty chilly. And we're coming in for just like short warm up breaks. So how that works is the students leave their gear on and take off their mittens, maybe unzip their coat a little bit, but it's an, and then they put their mask on and it's an opportunity for them to warm up, um, have their mittens off, maybe do an activity that they need to use their fingers or, or could use their fingers and then they can head back outside. So that's the picture there. You can see the orange group there. They came in, did their activity, and then zipped back out. Um, and then one of the other things that we did when we came back in July, uh, one of our teachers sewed each student their very own supply bag to use, and those are in their color groups too. And the reason we did that is because one of the early recommendations was that students not share materials in any way. And we weren't really sure how we could pull that off. Um, and so uh, one of our teachers, Michelle, sewed everybody their own bag. And then we asked the parents to send in um, crayons, scissors, um, you can put little magnifying glasses, whatever materials the students might need while they're outdoors. And then um, they are not sharing any materials back and forth. And now, you know, many months into it, because back then people were still wiping off their groceries, you know, before they brought them in the house. And it seems like there's much less concern about COVID being on the crayons uh, than there was. But we, you know, we didn't know a lot in July. So um, I'm not sure it's as necessary that we have these little bags. But what we learned along the way is that the students do a really great job um, keeping track of their own materials. And um, it's just kind of a ni another nice opportunity for them to practice some independent skills. So like that, that picture on the left, each of our teachers teaches multiple sessions. And so they can just dump those bags in their backpack and head out. Um, you can see our little friend in the middle, she's in the yellow group. So she's got her little yellow bag. And when she's done with her journal or whatever she was working on, she can just pack up her stuff and take it back to the teacher and then um, have the rest of her exploration time there. And then another thing that um, one of our teachers found that uh, we've been doing ourselves and then with our students, and that's my head there on the left. And um, you can probably even see, I just pinned those buttons on because I wear a few different hats and so I didn't want to sew them. But it really, it saves your ears. I don't know if other people have feel like that. Sometimes we notice when you're wearing a hat all day, it's kind of tender on your ears by the end of the day. And so um, we stuck those buttons on the side and it also it helps the teachers take a mask break easily if they're just observing the play. Um, our teachers are masked at all times. Um, except for if they're in the woods and the students are, you know, a distance away from them and they're just watching them explore, then they can take a mask break. And then uh, you can see the boys there. That, those are the blue group boys. And um, you can see Milan there with the black hat. He's got that big button there. And so even with his gloves on, he can, he can loop that on and off himself pretty easily. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to show you, we just did this last week. Um, one, of, one of the greatest challenges for us has been finding ways to connect with our families. That's probably what I would say is our program's greatest strength. We do a ton of family events and we have a monthly parent meeting. And right now we're still not having the parents come inside the school. They drop off and pick up at the door. So um, 
we've really struggled with that, with that loss of connection, but we did do this event and um, our families loved it. And so it's a super easy and safe one to do. We had, um, you have to have a lot of mason jars, but um, we just put them out in the trail with the little tea lights and the families could um, hike with their family unit and they saw their friends and um, our families are really respectful and responsible with keeping distance among themselves, but there was a sense of community in the woods just kind of being near each other and hiking together. Um, so that's a, a pretty easy and inexpensive and safe way to have an event if you're if you're looking for ideas for that. Um, and then I thought I would just wrap up with a couple um, kind of a couple things we've learned along the way. That was us just last week after the inauguration. We were pretty excited to see Bernie with his um, teacher, his teacher mittens that we all, we all pulled ours right out and said, ah, way to go, Bernie. Um, but one thing I would say is uh, that has helped us along the way is to really communicate clearly and often with our families. Our teachers send a weekly email um, similar to what Sheila showed with um, pictures and kind of a narrative of what, what the students have been doing in the woods because in other years, the families are invited to take hikes with us and um, we've really tried to minimize risk anywhere we could and we're not having volunteers or parents or um, people around our staff or students yet. So um, th those weekly emails have been really helpful. We've learned that it's okay to make changes along the way. I used to kind of worry well, I already told the parents this, so I don't want to go back and confuse them. And this year I've kind of decided, you know, I'm going to support the teachers however I can every step of the way. So, you know, I told them to drop at this door, but it's actually easier to do this one. So kind of retraining the parents along the way sometimes and not worrying about that because um, they've, they've been incredibly understanding and um, just giving myself some grace to to work through it along the way and um, make the changes when, when we need to. Um, another thing that I have really um, valued this year is that the, the focus of our program it has is always been about our students' time in the woods and um, certainly less about any kind of academic um, skills or metrics in any way, but we do, we're, we're teachers, we do think about new literacy activities or are we doing enough math and things like that. And, and we still do think about those things, but certainly um, our goals for the year were be safe and have fun. And that is really it, be safe and have fun and um, love our students, um, give them opportunities to love each other and love being in nature. And that, that definitely has always been the big goal, but we can get caught up in the little things that we're always trying to um, be better at or, or worry too much about. And this year, um, there's been a simplicity that we're all learning to embrace and enjoy. So um, that has been nice. And then another thing that has helped me a lot is to network with other um, directors. I'm in a monthly um, chat group with other local um, preschool directors and they're not nature-based, but they're also kind of fumbling through the same questions about licensing and enrollment and things like that. So um, finding some buddies, some, some peers to talk with. Um, Catherine at Schlitz and I have had some really nice phone conversations. Um, because she's in a similar um, climate and program model. So finding a, finding a peer to, to chat with um, can help validate some of your decisions and, and thinking along the way. Um, and then to not look too far ahead. And oh man, that was hard for me. We used to really live by a very full school calendar and have many, many events and fun things and all kinds of um, all kinds of lot, lots of extra things besides just our program. And this year I didn't even do a school calendar because it's disappointing to cancel things. And there's so many unknowns. And um, that was a sort of something we had to mourn at the beginning of the year, like, oh, maybe we won't be able to do this or this or this. And um, 
now that we let it go, it really feels so good to just, when it's Tuesday, we might be thinking about Wednesday, but we're not even thinking about Thursday. So we're just really um, wrapping ourselves into each day with our students in the woods um, in a different way than we have ever allowed ourselves to do. And then finally, we have really learned to appreciate each other. And I would say, especially the teachers, we have asked so much of teachers this year. We asked them to put their own health and safety at risk every day and that of their families and to carry that burden to school and still remain joyful and creative and um, innovative and make changes all the time and, and do their regular job, but with all of this swirling around. And so to start and end every day with gratitude for each other and our, our students in the woods, that's kind of been um, something we've really focused on. So I think that's it. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, and Kathleen, you can share now. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you all for welcoming me into your uh, community, today, community today. I'm really excited to be here and I'm excited to um, present. Um, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about this work that I've been doing for the past couple months. Um, and it's not, I, while I have in, tried to include some early childhood and preschool voices in this work generally, I'm not focusing on that at all today. Um, I, and, and I will say there've already been some sort of previews of what you're about to hear from me, from Christy, what you were saying in your survey findings and from some of what Sheila and Heather both shared too. So hopefully this will still feel relevant even though it's not focused on preschool. Um, so I have been working for the past couple of months on this project with NAAE to just sort of better understand what's happening in outdoor learning right now um, in these uncertain and unusual pandemic times that we've now been living in for what over 10 months is it? Um, we know that students and teachers across the country obviously haven't been able to return to school in a way that resembles what it did pre-COVID. We also know that outdoor learning has a lot of potential as a way to help schools to safely reopen. So we just wanted to understand what is happening, how, what, what does outdoor learning look like right now? And we decided to largely focus on what environmental education and outdoor learning organizations have been doing to support schools and teachers and students and families and communities to continue to bring outdoor learning to kids. Um, so over the past couple of months, I've had the great privilege and pleasure of talking with NAAAE affiliate leaders in 22 states and to folks representing 33 organizations across the country, including some people that are on this call right now. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit of about what I've learned about the types of shifts that programs have been making, some of the challenges they've been encountering, some of the things that have helped them along the way, some sort of silver linings that are coming out of what's been going on, um, and finally some lessons learned. And I'm gonna try and give you some quick examples, but there's just so much that I'm not gonna be able to cover. So I'm really just kind of scratching the surface here. Um, so to start, just some of the ways that programs have been shifting in this time. Um, one of the big ones is that a lot of programs have been shifting programming to virtual or online. Um, and this uh, can take a few different forms. In some cases, it looks like synchronous learning for classes. So uh, an environmental education program might say, look, you can't come to us for a field trip right now. So we're gonna come to your computer screen. <laughs> um, and that might be to an entire class that is together in a school, in a classroom, or it might be to a individual students as they're virtually learning. Um, another version of online or virtual programming that's been happening is some organizations have been doing a lot of public programming online, um, live. So this could look 
like they might be using Zoom or they might be using Facebook Live um, to do programming that's just directed at the general public. Um, and often those videos, while they're live in the moment, are then uploaded onto YouTube so they can be viewed by anyone at any time. And sometimes this replaces regular, um, what would normally be in-person public programming and some, some of it's totally brand new. Um, there's also virtual field trips and educational videos that people are producing. So some programs are having educators go out um, on a hike uh, that they would generally do with students and film what they're seeing and, and, and talk about uh, what they're seeing. Um, so it's a way for um, people to continue learning without actually being in the outdoor environment with the educator. So these are being used by teachers with their students, by parents with their kids, by members of the public. Um, so those are a couple ways that um, programs have been shifting to virtual or online. Um, programs are also taking their regular, or organizations are taking their regular programming to new locations. So an example of this that I love is the Elizabeth River Project in Virginia has a learning barge where students, they usually host a lot of field trips where students come and spend time on their barge learning about the watershed um, and about the river. Um, and they have not been able to use their learning barge very much during this time. So they contacted the architects at the University of Virginia that designed the barge originally and said, can you help us design a barge on wheels? Um, so now they have a van that they take around, they take it to the kids on school grounds or in neighborhoods that tries to bring some of the learning experiences that would be happening on the barge. It, it now lives on the barge on wheels. Um, Another example of this is a lot of residential environmental education organizations are not able right now to welcome students to their campuses. Um, so some of them are going to school grounds. So the Conservancy for Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio is a residential program that can't welcome students right now. So they're, they've been piloting this schoolyard learning and teaching program where one of their educators goes to a school and works with students on their school grounds once a week for four consecutive weeks. And in that time, they try to cover what they would have covered in the typical program on their campus. So those are some examples of taking programming to different locations. There's some totally new programming going on. So one example is the Montana Outdoor Science School in Montana um, usually provides programming during the school year that's geared towards schools and teachers. They go to schools, they host field trips at their site. Right now, what they're doing instead is they've partnered with the local school districts to essentially fill a childcare gap. They're providing day-long programs for individual children so that students have a place to go on the days that they're learning virtually. Um, the Teton Science Schools in Wyoming has done something similar. They've partnered with the local school district and some other local nonprofits to provide programming on an elementary school campus on the one day a week <clears throat> that those schools are learning virtually. So a Teton Science Schools educator goes to the school, oversees the virtual learning for kids who, again, don't have anywhere else to go um, for part of the day. And then they take the kids outside into the schoolyard for to do their own Teton Science Schools programming for another part of the day. So those are some interesting pivots that programs are making. And then there's just some whole new endeavors going on. And one that I'm really excited about is Teach Outdoors Minnesota. Um, so right now with a lot of typical outdoor learning field trips not feasible and with teachers extra motivated, I think, to be outside for health and safety reasons, there's an even more sort of pronounced need to support classroom teachers to bring their students outside. So Joe Waleski from Wolfridge Environmental Learning Center and Anna Dukey, who I know is on this call, and some other folks have started Teach Outdoors Minnesota and it's providing professional development and training to prepare teachers to incorporate outdoor learning in their practice. Um, so they're, they're now starting in the very beginning of January having weekly webinars um, for teachers um, where each one is led by somebody who's experienced with outdoor learning um, and they're just helping teachers to learn skills. Um, and to be prepared to teach outside. <clears throat> and those are open to anyone, not just to teachers in Minnesota. 
Um, and the other idea of this is it's really, it's providing those virtual PD experiences, but also sort of creating a network or web of classroom teachers that will be able to support one another. Um, a lot of the state NAAA affiliates have also been providing a lot more online professional development opportunities. Um, and in all of these cases and all the shifts that are being made, these organizations and providers are doing whatever they need to do, yeah, to survive as an organization during this time, but also really to serve the community. Um, so I saw somebody said before that the teachers that Sheila and Heather were talking about are doing heroic things. And the same thing is happening with these EE and outdoor learning educators. Um, I gotta start talking faster <laughs> now, I think, or skipping, skipping over some things. So some challenges that there have been challenges that programs are facing as they make these shifts. One of them, and Christy, you talked about this a little bit in the introduction is the uncertainty. From day to day, things are changing. We don't know what COVID numbers are gonna look like. We don't know what the regulations are gonna look like. And this is a real challenge for anyone who's trying to plan a program. So Heather, I love what you just said about, you can't really plan necessarily that far in advance. Just take things as they come and figure it out. So that's a challenge. There's also, um, these programs don't always know what it is that teachers need and what's going to be most helpful so teachers as we all know are so overwhelmed right now you all are doing heroic work um and ee and outdoor learning providers they want to do what they can to be as helpful as possible but it's not it's often difficult to know what that is and there are some efforts underway to capture this information so a lot of the state and NAAA affiliates uh, have put out surveys or are trying to gather this information, um, but it really it is it's a challenge. It's hard to know what would be most helpful. Some people aren't always finding it easy to to find the resources and expertise that they need during this time either to make the shifts in their <clears throat> in their um, roles that they need to make. And there we know there are tons of resources out there. There's groups like this. There are groups like Manico and Nimpo and Inside Outside and uh, Teach Outdoors Minnesota and AAAE. There's Beatles materials out of the Lawrence Hall of Science, but not everyone is plugged in or knows where to find those things so that's a challenge and then of course there's technology challenges <laughs> with all this stuff moving online it's hard to know which platform to use how to troubleshoot when you run into issues how best to engage students in a virtual environment um but people are learning and they're working through those technology challenges there's also some systemic issue issues around technology not everyone has access to wi-fi or devices so it's an ongoing question of how do we make sure everyone has access to what it is that we can provide. Um, so there are challenges, but there are also things that are helpful. Um, some of those are flexibility. Almost everyone I talked to talked about how important it is to be flexible. These organizations have needed to pivot and pivot and pivot again. Um, and this is something that the outdoor education field generally is really good at, but the field has needed to really step up even more and be more flexible in this moment. Um, as one program leader told me, it's not just adapting, it's reimagining right now. Um, another thing that's helpful is that donors and funders have really been stepping up. I think funders are really recognizing the challenges of this time and a lot of them have loosened restrictions on grant dollars. Um, so that's happening generally, but then it also seems that some of this is happening because in some cases, it's really helped by um, the, re the trusting relationships that providers have built with their funders over time. So it lets the funders feel comfortable saying, okay, I'm gonna take a step back and trust you to do what you know you need to do to, to make things keep working. Um, so relationships are really important. There's also some, been some new funding opportunities um, and I could give several examples, I'll stop myself, but I'll talk about just one. Um, the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation has always had a grant program, but just this year they added an outdoor classroom grant to their grant program and the, it's open right now. So they're offering up to $10,000 grants to community-based nonprofits or publicly funded schools just to help get students outside to build outdoor classrooms. So that's just one example. And I know there's potentially more funding coming. Sarah, I think I saw that um, Sarah Boder put a comment in the chat earlier about that. So keep your eyes out for new funding opportunities. 
um, networks, networks like this one, and Heather, you just talked about this too, are so important and so helpful to people right now. Um, the NAAW state affiliates have really been doing a good job bringing people together. I had multiple program providers, just as an example, in the state of Rhode Island, talk about how you know they could all be in competition with one another because there's only so many dollars that can go to outdoor learning and environmental education but instead they've really come together to support one another during this time to learn from one another so networks are critical um, and another thing is just identifying or being a champion for outdoor learning so find the person in your school or in the school that you're working with or be the person who's really going to go to bat for for outdoor learning um, there have also been some, some sort of silver linings that have come from this time. A lot of programs are finding that they're able to reach bigger or newer or expanded audiences. This is particularly the case with those that have moved to virtual programming. Um, they found that they're allowed to, they're able to reach a lot of folks that wouldn't otherwise be able to access their programs either because of distance or time constraints or cost. So that's really exciting. Um, there's also new partnerships and connections and networks forming during this time. <clears throat> so just a quick example, the White Memorial Conservation Center in Connecticut has a new partnership. This is very different from the preschool kids that you all are thinking about, but they have a new partnership with local senior centers. So that's a new audience that they weren't able to reach before in a new partnership. Um, the Oregon Outdoor Schools has developed a community of practice during this time where they're now meeting weekly with one another virtually and able to share in a way that they never have been before and learn from one another. So <clears throat> that's exciting. Um, a lot of programs are seeing increased membership and increased visibility because of the programming shifts that they've had to make during this time. And a lot, although everyone is busier than they've ever been before, just trying to figure things out, create new programming and really just survive, a lot of people have also found that they, they have time right now to get new projects off the ground that they've been wanting to do for a long time. So I think that's another silver lining. Um, and while all of these shifts have, have um, been necessitated by the pandemic, a lot of programs are hoping to continue to keep some of these changes in place. So that's exciting to me. So just quickly, some big lessons learned that I've taken from this. Um, don't get stuck in what's comfortable. Be flexible, take chances, be willing to try, to fail, to try again. Um, so that's that flexibility thing again. Ask for help, whether it's you're looking for funding, for gear donations, for expertise, people want to help. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, another one is leverage the existing partnerships and networks that you already have. Um, while a lot of programs look different, a lot of the program providers are continuing to work with schools and individuals that they already had relationships with. with. So build on those relationships, let people know that you're there for them and want to help and step in where you can. Um, the power of partnerships. I already talked about this a little bit. Partnerships are really powerful. There's only so much anyone can do on their own. Um, so use those partnerships. Remember that success is going to look different right now. You know, you might be serving 100 kids instead of the 2000 that you're used to, but you're still serving your mission. So just as long as you keep your mission in mind, it's okay if things look a little bit different right now. And then the last one, and I think this is really important, take advantage of the moment. Right now is the time to try new things, to bring maybe reluctant stakeholders on board with outdoor learning, to engage the teachers and the parents who are really eager to spend time outside right now and show them that it can be done and how great it is. Um, the time to advocate is the time to go after funding opportunities. So while this moment is horrible, there are some there's some good stuff that's happened and take advantage of where we are so that's that was my my quick my quick uh run through all of this and um as christy mentioned there will there's a report coming so look for a report on a computer screen near you sometime in the near future thank you thank you so much thank you to all of our speakers 
Um, I know that those presentations took a little longer than we planned, but there was so much good information in there and great suggestions. Um, and I'm going to just give me a moment. I'll share my screen again. Um, so uh, the next screen we have here is about breakout rooms because that was our plan. Um, but I just, before we get to Q&A, if people have some questions for um, Kathleen or Heather or Sheila, um, ultimately, I think because of the, the time spent on presentations, and again, not a bad thing at all, we'll skip breakout rooms this time, but we did create, um, and I'll post them in the in the chat, we did create um, some jam boards that you can go in and look at the questions and add your own thoughts to them. Um, and if I, you know, I encourage you to right after this call, spend like a couple minutes thinking about one of the topics, um, either outdoor learning, uh, um, here there, outdoor education, um, staffing, or um, thoughts around burnout, um, and just sh share some things that you've been dealing with, some ideas, some strategies, anything, um, because any, as we can see here with our three presenters, anything you have to share, little tidbits, is so helpful. Those connections, um, and just knowing what other people are doing, knowing, knowing what other people have tried, um, what's worked, what hasn't worked for them is so valuable right now. Um, everything is just testing it out and, and figuring out what works for you. So I would encourage you again, I'll put the links in the chat to still, even though we won't spend time in breakout rooms, um, to still visit those, um, jam boards. If you haven't used it before, I'll show you really quick. Um, and type in some thoughts if you if you have time. Um, and actually, just before we wrap up, I wanted to give us an opportunity um, for anyone who had questions of uh, any of our speakers. If you wanted to, feel free to unmute yourselves um, and just ask your question or type it in the chat if you'd prefer. I know some people. Um, prefer to ask their questions that way, totally okay. Um, so we'll just give a minute here for anyone who wants to ask a question or share. Uh, I just want, this is Sheila, I just wanted to say that I put in the chat um, a link to the classroom pages. So you can click based on the age group and you can see lesson plans or documentation for the whole school year. and. Um, it's always just that school year. So you can go back into the fall, but then you can come back and check it in the spring if you'd like. Um, and we have that available every year in case people ever need some ideas. Thank you, Sheila. I just dropped some questions in the chat that are what the GM boards are focused around and I'll put the links in there now as well, but still feel free to uh, jump in and ask a question. I get it, it's the end of the day. It's been a long day long week already. Um, okay, I'll share again briefly. Feel free again if you if you want to put a question in the chat while I'm just wrapping up. Um, I wanted to just while I have everyone's attention to just remind people to um, about our conference, which is coming up this summer. Um, we will be um, virtual again this year, which we're really excited about. We think it's just the right decision for keeping everyone safe. Um, and giving lots of people the opportunity to join us again. Um, so the save, I want you guys all to, to save the date, put it in your calendars, July 26th to 30th this summer. Um, and also, if you have an idea of something that you can share with our community, um, please we encourage you to submit a proposal. The deadline is next Friday. Um, and either way, if you wanna submit a proposal or not, um, help us spread the word. Uh, I know so many of you are working with um, programs who are just starting to get outside, let them know of this opportunity. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you could help um, share 
share that this conference is happening this summer. Um, and then also just quickly, um, another reminder that we have these forums every month um, and that's a great opportunity for people to connect, but we also have um, a Google group that is just Natural Start Alliance um, and it's really active and it's an opportunity for people anytime to post a question about something they're dealing with, to share a resource. Um, and I think I see something new come in there almost every day and really, really engaging great discussion. Um, so I highly encourage you um, to join the Google group. I'll also drop that link in the chat if you're not a part of it already. And keep in touch with us, email us anytime, info at naturalstart.org. We like to just know what's going on with you um, and share, share your stories um, or if you have any questions or if you're looking for someone to connect with near you, we're good at that. We're good at connecting people. So um, if you're looking for someone, reach out to us anytime. Um, and let me just drop these couple links in. Sorry. I got a lot going on on my screen. I'm sure everyone can relate to that. I'll put a bunch of links in here. If I can find the chat. Okay. Oh, and I see lots of nice comments. Um, okay. And last, I put the links to the Jamboard in there. Um, but last thing I just want to show you if you've never used it. Oh, great. I see people in there already. Um, you can just add a sticky note, any thought you want, add it on there. Um, if you agree with something, feel free to put a like, a heart next to it if it really, um, if you can really relate to that. And there's four pages, four questions. This is awesome. And thank you so much for adding stuff in there. This is really, really useful for us. Um, so there's this one with outdoor ad, there's staffing um, and burnout as well. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, um, we'll wrap up. I'll stop sharing and say thank you again to our wonderful speakers. Thank you to everyone who for joining us today um, and look for an announcement about our next forum next month. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.